This podcast is presented by the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm Heather. I'm Vilma. I'm Darlene. And this is our podcast, These Books Made Me, Manga Edition. Today we're going to be talking about Sailor Moon. Friendly warning as always, this podcast contains spoilers. If you don't know yet who Chibi Usa's mom is, continue at your own risk. All right, so Sailor Moon is a manga, and the demographic is shoujo. So shoujo are manga that target girls and young women. There is no definite age range, and the target age demographic ranges from 7 to 18 years old. The original run of this manga was from December 28, 1991 to February 3, 1997. The original English release date was from 1998 to 2001. It was initially collected in 18 Tankoban volumes, and then the second edition was 12 volumes, and the third edition was 10 volumes. So I will say that the different editions caused problems for me when I was trying to reread (laughs) because I was moving between editions, and so they were chunked differently, and I was super confused. But it was really fun to revisit, so I wanted to ask you guys, what did this book series mean to you? Was this your first time reading? Did you read it as a child? How did it stack up to your memories of Sailor Moon from when you were younger? So this question kind of brought back a core memory, I guess. I distinctly remember watching it after school. I would go up the hill. Uh, I was supposed to go to my babysitter's house, but I'd always take a detour to like her neighbor's house because she had cable. And so I would always watch it and it would be on Uh, Cartoon Network at like 4 p.m. And so I distinctly remember watching it and finding a lot of comfort in it because I uh, did not really like my (laughs) babysitter. So it was like a nice little like memory. I was like, wow, I had completely forgotten about that. I guess it's always given me a sense of comfort. And I always come back to it, I think, for that reason. But I didn't discover the manga until later. For me, I have fond memories of Sailor Moon. Um, I approached it in a different way. Though, So when I was in middle school, my friends and I didn't necessarily watch the show, but one of us was like a really big fan. So she was like, oh, you're this and you're this and you're this. And I was Mars. Um, I'm hoping it's more because of my long hair than my temper. Who knows? (laughs) This was in seventh grade. So it's that weird age where it's like you're no longer a kid. You don't quite feel like a teenager. So it helped us to kind of be childish, but also teenage superheroes and be cute. So that's kind of how I was introduced to it. Like I said, one of my friends was a fan, so she would let me borrow her movies. And it's actually really funny. Um, My cousins in El Salvador, I went to visit and they had the game and the music on their computer. So I was actually introduced to the movies, the game, the concept way before I ever read the manga. I didn't actually read the manga until I was an adult. And the show I watched very sporadically. But yeah, definitely for me, it's it's that nostalgia of childhood, reclaiming childhood. And it was just cute. I just remember that. The aesthetic was very cute. Your friend that would assign everyone, did she assign herself Sailor Moon? No, actually, she assigned herself Sailor Mercury. She was super oh, smart. She was super okay. smart. Okay. So it was just funny. She got Sailor Mercury. <laughs> um, the twins, because there were two twins in our group, they were Sailor Moon and Sailor Venus. Okay. That makes sense. Oh, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my other friend, Teresa, she was Sailor Jupiter, which she thought was ridiculous because she was the shortest of the group. And she's like, just, she was always like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I guess everything couldn't fit perfectly. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was like a short queen inside. She was like big, like personality maybe. Yeah. For me, I w- knew the manga first because one of my classmates had a Sailor Moon. I think this was around first or second grade for me. And she had a Sailor Moon sweatshirt, a cute little pink Sailor Moon sweatshirt. And I asked her what it was. And she had the manga and she would show it to me. So, and then like when it aired on TV, I like freaked out because I was so excited that I was finally going to be able to like actually see it and hear it in English because she tried to translate it for me because it came in Mandarin. It was a big thing for me also growing up. I was very much a tomboy. So sometimes I'd be like, oh, I'm similar to Sailor Jupiter and that I like sports and I like to just beat up (laughs) random (laughs) little kids who bothered me. But then like I got shyer as I got older. Yeah, I remember coming home like early and watching it and then Dragon Ball Z would follow as well. So it's definitely a great memory for me. Yeah, I think I'm like, Darlene and Vilma and that I was aware of the anime before I got to the manga. So I did them out of order as well. And I liked the anime. I mean, I, I remembered it, 
you know, more like nostalgically, like I didn't remember all of the details of it or anything, but like, of course I remember the song, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a very iconic aesthetic as well. And for some reason it's like very tangled up in my head with Buffy. So I think like I was feeling girl power, Mm -hmm. like at the time or something. Um, So I read the manga when I was a little bit older and I really liked the manga a lot. Like it was definitely one of the series that got me into manga and really just enjoying manga overall. Um, and so Sailor Moon was a gateway series for me, I think. But yeah, I, again, it just kind of like nostalgia. And um, it was very interesting revisiting it now as an adult because I had forgotten a lot of things, mm. especially from the anime, uh, where I was just kind of surprised to be rewatching it now with adult eyes and being a little bit more critical of what I was seeing. <laughs> uh, but it was it was a fun romp to to do both again. Yeah, I think because the anime was so comforting for the longest time, it was what I preferred. But I think in recent years, like because I revisited the series as a whole, like very often, and I think. I think maybe this time around when I was reading the manga, I was like, you know, I actually prefer the manga. I do think that I had like a nostalgic lens over the anime for so Mm -hmm. long. And so like I held on to it. But I do think that the manga reads better in terms of like making a more tight knit plot. Yeah, I do like revisiting stuff for that reason, too. Just how much your opinion of it can change. Darlene, you did some research on the history of the magical girl trope for us. Did you want to tell us a little bit about what you found? Uh, Yeah, I thought it may be beneficial to bring it back to the origins of the genre that Sailor Moon hails from. Um, And so in the name of the moon, I will throw some information at you. (laughs) Um, Magical Girls is a subgenre of shoujo or shoujo shows and mangas aimed at teen girls. And they feature girls who possess supernatural powers. The shows usually depict these magical girls coming of age or maturing while getting a handle on their powers, which both aid and complicate their lives. So two series in the late 1960s that are credited with starting this beloved genre are Maho Tsukai Sally, so Little Witch Sally in 1966, and Himitsu no Akochan, or Akochan's Got a Secret, which debuted in 1969. Both existed as mangas before being made into anime, and these animes were ripe for success given the popularity of the American TV series Bewitched in Japan. Little Sally Witch was heavily influenced by Bewitched, while Akochan's Got a Secret was loosely based on the American movie I Married a Witch, from which Bewitched took inspiration. So elements of the magical girl genre include magic, adventure, secret identities, and colorful transformations and costumes. A popular subtrope within this genre is the magical girl warrior, which is the combination of a magical girl and a superheroine. It is within this trope where the internationally successful and beloved series Sailor Moon exists. Its creator, Naoko Takuchi, started off with the idea of Sailor V, a young lone warrior for justice in a sailor suit. The character featured in the serialization codenamed Sailor V in 1991, which ran in the manga magazine Run Run. It proved popular, so Takuchi expanded on the idea, combining it with another of her favorite anime tropes, the superhero team-up, and that is how we got Sailor Moon. One thing that I really liked that you mentioned was that like, she sort of turned it into a, a team thing rather than focusing on the sort of lone wolf superheroine. When we were doing our prep for this pod, we did bring up Buffy multiple times, and I also brought up Wonder Woman, which was probably the first like comic superheroine that I read, but she was always in a group with a bunch of men. And like Buffy also had guys in the group. Like then I was trying to think of any sort of similar time period shows where really it was a group of girls that were operating like that. And I didn't really come up with any where they really were superheroines. I mean, I thought of like Gem was kind of similar time period and maybe sort of a similar idea was it was much more like girl power and it was really focused on the girls. But it was interesting to me because I think we think of like American entertainment as being a little bit more empowering to girls in certain ways than, than Japanese entertainment 
in this instance, it feels like the opposite happened where like the American versions that were sort of running on the same like idea was like, no, we have to put men more prominently in it or it's not going to sell or something. I was just thinking about that when you were talking, because I, I feel like that was an interesting, unexpected thing as we were revisiting it, where I was like, you know, this is really a lot more progressive yeah. than you would think it would be, especially for the time period yeah. that it came out. Yeah. And I feel like I was trying to get a sense of if there was anything around in Japan at the time that was the same, because when she listed like the team ups that she liked, they were also like they featured mostly men or like a combination as well. And so I kind of wanted to delve more into why she chose all uh, girls. But I think that had more to do with her own upbringing. And I think like the friends and like the office mates that she had or her coworkers rather, and just like talking to them and getting advice from them and support from them. And so I think it was more so like her life experiences that made her want to have a super heroine team up. But yeah, I agree that we didn't see that till much later, I think, in American media. Like, I'm thinking Charmed. Like, Charmed mm -hmm. really comes up in my mind yeah. once I think about the 90s girl power. And then I also think of uh, early 2000s with uh, Powerpuff Girls and Totally Spies. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely seems like that was drawing from Sailor Moon rather than that the American entertainment was out in the lead with the concept, which is interesting, especially like going back to it the earlier series that you mentioned, like Little Witch Sally being based off of maybe Bewitched. It's interesting to see sort of the interplay between the two different industries kind of shaping what the other one's doing. Each episode, our intrepid researcher will enchant us with scintillating factoids relating to our book, in this case, our manga. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to our cultural corner. The part of the podcast where I tell you about some of the neat things that we've learned while doing some research about Sailor Moon. So one thing was Moon Rabbit. So fun fact, Usagi Tsukino actually has a meaning behind the name. Usagi means rabbit, hence the frequent appearance of bunnies in speech bubbles to indicate that Usagi is the one speaking. Suki no means of the moon. So Usagi's full name means rabbit of the moon or moon rabbit. This is a reference to the Japanese folklore tradition that the image formed on the moon's surface by its topography is that of a rabbit making mochi, which is rice cake. In the West, traditionally, the surface of the moon conjures images of a man in the moon, while in many parts of Asia, people saw a rabbit in the craters and mountains of the moon's surface. Beside the rabbit is a mallet, and in the Japanese interpretation, this mallet is used for pounding mochi rice cake. As for how the rabbit came to be on the moon, the Konjaku Monogatarishu records that a rabbit, a fox, and a monkey came across an old man who had lost his strength and lay dying. Each wanted to help the old man, and the monkey gathered nuts and berries for him to eat while the fox caught some fish in the river. But try as it might, the rabbit could find nothing with which to help the old man. After lamenting its powerlessness, it asked the fox and the monkey to build a fire and cooked itself for the old man to eat. Touched by this act of self-sacrifice, the old man revealed himself to be the Buddhist deity Sakra and sent the rabbit to the moon so that all would know of its good deeds. Side note, the Kunjaku uh, Monogatarishu, also known as the Kunjaku Monogatari, is one of Japan's oldest collections of stories. It contains more than 1,000 stories, many of which are supernatural folktales. And not only do China and Korea also share similar tales of the rabbit on the moon, but legends of moon rabbits are also among the indigenous people of the Americas. These legends are derived from lunar periodolia, seeing familiar objects or patterns in otherwise random or unrelated objects or patterns. Also, Usagi's hair is meant to bring back the idea of the rabbit. I told you guys I was skipping editions when I was trying to do the reread. Mm -hmm. And in one of the editions that I was using, it had the American names for mm -hmm. the characters and she's bunny in those. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was super weird. Just like 
reading it, they're like, Bunny, do this. Bunny, do that. Like, <laughs> yeah. Bunny's <laughs> crying again. And I'm like, ah, what's happening here? And I was very confused. But that's, yeah, they just like directly translated it. I have those. I showed them to Maria and it's like Bunny. And knowing that her name is Usagi, it wasn't too weird for me because I already went in with that knowledge. I don't know what the American reader would have thought. No, it would have been super confusing because it's like, <laughs> why is why is that her name? Like some of the names translated okay. I mean, Ami is Amy, which, all right, that makes sense. But yeah, for the other ones, they weren't particularly like related, it seemed like. And so if you didn't have context for that, because people aren't generally called bunny in the yeah. United States. Well, I don't know. Is Usagi like a common given name in Japan or was that like equally odd to people I reading it in know. Japanese? I wonder. I think it's, I mean, there is a graphic novel out right now and it's Usagi and and the Warriors, I think. I can't remember. But it's also a rabbit with its ears pulled back in the ponytail as if he were a samurai. So I think it might be a normal concept for them. But I mean, she became Serena in the American anime. I guess they pulled that from Princess Serenity. Serenity. Yeah. Yeah. So even then, but... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, also Japanese names, a lot of them tend to have meaning. Their names yeah. do, mm-hmm. in general, have meanings. I don't know if it was popular then. I feel like it had to get popular afterward, Usagi. Oh, yeah. I don't think it was probably too weird for them. I actually thought it was very cute in her of her to do that, you know, connecting her Sailor Moon to the moon, and which is why I was so surprised when it took them so long to realize she was the princess. I was like, come on. <laughs> you can't get more heavy-handed than this. Yeah, there's a lot of foreshadowing. Yeah. <laughs> So rereading this as grown-ups now, what do we think about Sailor Moon? How did it hold up? Every time I read it, I think that I'm always reading it out of nostalgia. And so I don't think I'll ever think anything negative of Sailor Moon. But I tried to look at it with a more critical eye this time since (laughs) we were talking about it. And I do think, and I thought this before, but I know that the creator also mentioned this in an interview, but she kind of knew that she didn't have like a tight knit plot and that uh, there were certain things that she felt were lacking in her writing. And so she felt like that actually was to her advantage or to the advantage of the popularity of it, because she felt like she kind of established enough lore that the fans kind of took over and they kind of filled in for her. And I do think that that really did add to a lot of the popularity that it had internationally because people could make it their own. Or if they had any questions that she hadn't answered, they could come up with their an- their own answers. I do see that. I do. There was like several questions that I had while reading it. And just a lot of things that I feel like the manga kind of, just tells you you're supposed to accept like you're just supposed to accept that she's going to become queen of like the silver millennium in the future but then it's like is that just tokyo is that like the whole world and like how does she become queen like the politics of that was (laughs) (laughs) trying to get your uh, like head around that was like uh, how is that even going to happen but i feel like that's where fans could come in and I, i feel like most successful properties are like that too like people kind of fill in where they feel like the author didn't answer their questions i also felt like it gained its popularity at a really interesting time in japan because it was just after um their equal employment opportunity opportunity law in 1985 and so that helped with more women going into manga so i do think that just even having like a woman's perspective in manga was like very important to helping it develop internationally. I don't know. I'm really like thankful for it. Like just like Heather, I think that it was my gateway into different mangas and different anime as well. And so while they're not the best written characters, it's still an important piece of work. And I just think that it was also very instrumental in like popularizing manga and anime in the West. I don't know. I'm forever thankful. <laughs> For it. And I do say this jokingly often. I wonder like how much of inspiration Sailor Moon and Buffy took from each other. But there's nothing to say that Joss Whedon was influenced by Sailor Moon. Although I did see in one of his biographies, someone say that the director of the movie, when he was doing rewrites, had suggested he look at Sailor Moon. But I think that they're too close in like release date that I don't know how true that is. Again, I'm not trying to... (laughs) 
I'm not trying to go against the director of the Buffy movie, but it just feels like... No, it sounds kind of apocryphal to me, too, because the release dates are so close to each other that you have to think that the movie was pretty much in the can at the point that the manga would have been available for him to suggest. But the similarities in some regards are really striking. And I don't know you know, how much of that is to say like, oh, well, these are common tropes. But I feel like at the time, these weren't particularly common tropes. They felt very fresh. So it is interesting that they kind of ran parallel to Mm -hmm. each other. And I mean, it could be that she put forth that as like an inspiration and maybe he didn't do, he didn't use it as much in the movie, but maybe took some of those ideas into the show because there are like the fact that they both, you know, spoiler, have to kill their loved ones with like a sword because they're possessed. Like I think, yeah, that was a really strong parallel mm-hmm. between them. And even just the way that they're portrayed. Um, I, I actually think that that's like a larger 90s thing where it was kind of like, Let's legitimize the fact that like these um, like very girly and feminine qualities can still be very powerful. And I think sometimes it went like not too far, but like it kind of went a little campy. But yeah, I I just associate them with each other for that reason as well, because I think Buffy as in the earlier seasons was very much like an unwilling heroine. Absolutely. And it was kind of like against her. Yeah, she did not want to be. The Slayer. And then she was also very like girly and just wanted to be a teen and um, was a little ditzy. (laughs) And like it was her friends that really kind of had to help her like figure some things out. Yeah, I I think you're right, though. Like the parallels are very, very strong, especially once you get to the show and you've moved away from the movie because it is it's the idea of this reluctant teen girl heroine who's just like very put upon with the burden of the sort of responsibility of being a superhero put on her where she's like, I really just wanted to go to this party. I really just (laughs) wanted to go play at the game center. I, you know, I didn't want to fight this guy today. And, and yeah. And like how her friends sort of support her and they all have a role to play in the fights, in her maturation um, and watching a girl grow into her power, I think is really, you know, I don't, I can't think of anything before Sailor Moon or Buffy, where that was the arc that I took away from watching it or reading it um, so much. So yeah, I I think there's just a lot there um, with similarities. And it is interesting too, that you brought up with like Japan's equal opportunity, sort of employment law coming about because she was sort of the next generation of women manga writers because there was this year 24 group that really started the shoujo genre. Um, And it was, they call it that because the women were all born round about the year 1924, I suppose. But they were so pigeonholed, like they only could write in that genre. And that genre was very specifically just for girls. There wasn't like crossover appeal to it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is really interesting seeing how like she sort of reflected maybe societal changes that were happening in in the manga as well. Because I think that you do see that it's it's owning the femininity and saying it's OK to like all of these girly things and to, you know, be very much uh, sort of the stereotypical girly girl. That doesn't make you weak. You know, it doesn't it doesn't mean that you're less than you can still be really important and, you know, be a hero in your own story, essentially. And I, I think that's a. We always ask, like, is a, is a work reflecting what was happening at the time mm-hmm. in the world? And I think for Sailor Moon, it definitely was. And then how like, that shaped girls going forward, because I think that's important, too. You know, representation in a superhero story, that's really important. Um, but yeah, like you, Darlene, I think, yeah, there's a strong element of nostalgia when revisiting it. I thought the manga held up pretty well. I got to be honest, like there's some things where I'm kind of like, Oh, I forgot that there was like this much of an age difference or like, that's a little weirder. Cause like, (laughs) again, like middle schooler with a, like basically a senior in high school, though it's less weird than it is in the, the anime, which it's like, yeah, I don't think he's even in school at that point. He's just like a guy. And then like all of the stuff with Naru and Nefra is like super disturbing in the anime, but the manga held up pretty well. Um, One thing I did notice, though, in the 
edition, the bunny edition that I had, <laughs> they also had all of these sidebars where they talked to the author and like half of them were about the anime. Mm. You know, they were asking her little questions and she said like in these little sidebars that were clearly like written for like 12 year old girls. She was like, well, it's men doing the anime. So they made a lot of changes, basically. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, they really did. Because then you watch the anime now and I have forgotten a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> the anime is a lot more problematic than the manga yeah. because I think, you know, it does retain clearly like some of the major themes, but the male gaze in the anime, like you can't get away from it at all. And it's real disturbing at points, but we'll, we'll have more to say about that. Um, Vilma <laughs> Maria, how did, how did that hold up for you? <laughs> Uh, right. So when it comes to Sailor Moon, I agree with you guys, the nostalgia, you know, you can't avoid it. Like, um, and like I said, for me, it was an interesting journey because I didn't even read the manga until I was in my 20s. I was introduced to it through like the movies and the merchandising and the pretty pictures that you find online. The fan art, like that's mm -hmm. the stuff that introduced me to it. And the fan art was not necessarily reflective of the anime, more reflective of how you interpreted the anime. So it's just, it was interesting. Um, so I read it for the first time in my mid twenties. And I have to say, I did not like Usagi. I did not like it. I was like this crybaby, And it, I was just so disappointed. Like she was not the leading lady I was looking for. And it was really a bit of a shock. I was like, I don't remember this. <laughs> like, so now rereading it for this, I had to keep reminding myself to be forgiving of her because she's a child at the beginning yeah, of it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so easy to forget that because like, especially when she does her transformation and you get this womanly body, but it's like, this is a 14 year old girl who didn't go looking for adventure like Ash Ketchum, you know, she's not <laughs> off gallon. She was literally walking down the street and she does have protector qualities. Like she saw Luna getting beat in, beaten up in the street and she like intervened. So she's just this, you know, sweet kind of ditzy girl. And she kind of gets thrown into this madness. And, I, you know, I have to when I got frustrated with her, I'd have to remind myself, how would you have reacted, Vilma, at 14 when you've got creepy vampire goal monsters coming after you? I'm like, <laughs> I probably would have stood there and cried, too. Like, that's honestly that would have been my response. So, yeah, the nostalgia and trying to be more understanding of her has helped me this time around. And of course, despite all its faults, we shouldn't forget the fact that this anime this manga put these five teenage girls constantly saving the world and like through bigger and bigger threats they got stronger and stronger each one of them um, became more mature and I think that's a great message because it basically shows growth you know all of them especially Usagi they really grew they matured and that's an important message to give to girls you don't have to start out being the strongest or the smartest or whatever um, and also the fact that it talked about unity. It talked about emotions, which are usually devalued um, in society. It's like, you know, stop being so emotional. Be rational. No, in Sailor Moon, it's like, use your emotions. Use your heart. This is where your power is coming from. It's not taking away from it. So, yeah, with Sailor Moon, it's it has a lot of good things, like I said. But then, like you guys have also said, there's a lot of stuff in it that is kind of like uh, skeevy. The for me and Maria, we talked about this earlier. Yeah. The Chibi Usa stuff that is a huge yeah. thing. Her obsession with who, spoiler alert, is her father, you yeah. know, her romantic obsession with him was just every time I saw it, I would just cringe and get really uncomfortable. And I was like, what was the mangaka thinking by focusing so much of the story on this? Like, it just. I didn't see how it added to the story. It added a weird conflict and tension between this family unit. So like I said, pioneer, problematic. Um, the fact that Usagi at times had to be bullied into it. Like I think it was episode four of the anime where Luna was like, I will claw your face if you don't transform right now and fight the monster. I was like, Jesus, Luna. Like, <laughs> at the same time, I understood the frustration. And then there's the fact that at different points, it seemed like the other scouts would have been better leaders than Usagi. Usagi, but you know, Usagi had the innate power, like she had to be their leader. But it's like, did she grow enough because she would constantly be immature? It was, you know, it's a ride. It's definitely a ride. It's and, 
throughout it again, when I would start getting frustrated, I'd be like, remember, through all of this, I think most of it happens in that one year period. Mm -hmm. And then like that last arc, they're in high school. So literally it was like one year where all of this stuff was happening to her. So being understanding of her (laughs) is kind of important, keeping an open mind and never forgetting, you know, just how important she is overall to how we view heroines today in general. It's interesting you say that about Chibi Usa because for the longest time I thought the same. Side note, like I kind of wanted us to do like a TikTok of like where the Sailor Scouts would go, like what branch they would go to. (laughs) And so I was like, I was like, well... Um, I, I would have to say that Chibi Usa would be at Beltsville because we do have that little mural with the white horse. Oh. Um, <laughs> and I was like, that's how you know I'm not biased because I actually do not like Chibi Usa and I would not like her within <laughs> ten, like, 10 feet of me. Um, but I was like rereading the manga and I was like, I don't I don't know if this is giving Takuchi like too much credit, but it almost felt like Freudian in a mm. way, like because she's 900 years old and I don't think I picked up on that like several times like for a while and then I was like well why did she stay such a like why did she say it's so childlike and I think it's obviously because she was coddled and she grew up in a time of like immense peace and yeah like and she was lonely as well like I, I think they thought that because she had everything, she didn't really need, like, friends, you know, because there was no enemies. There was nothing, like, bad going on in her life. And so I think I just gained more appreciation for that Black Lady arc in a way that I didn't have before. Like, I used to really hate that arc, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But the evil person in that arc was promising her, um, like, to actually finally grow up. And the way that they explored that and, like, the evil side of that was in maturing as well and kind of going into her sensuality was that she also still had this obsession with her dad yeah yeah but yeah i mean i think it's just because there's nothing there's no love or anything else that she's ever known Mm -hmm. and so she's never been able to like grow or experience anything and mature in any significant way you're right it's just it's a very like stunted development yeah Yeah. it's like she got stuck yeah and i think she resents them a little bit for it and then feels a little guilty that she resents them for it so i think that's also why she kind of can be antagonistic towards uh usagi a lot of the times yeah i mean and there's also what happened with neo queen serenity i mean when she was like in that deep sleep i mean we see we wonder if this disillusion when she meets usagi versus like her mother who's known as like almost like a savior Mm -hmm. in crystal tokyo and then she comes across this person who's her mom but is a brat so it's just like well you're a brat so (laughs) i get to i get to be the 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 good one, and mm-hmm. I get to be the one who should one day end up with Mamoru, my dad, which is just yeah. still, but like, I mean, <laughs> just like, I guess going along with this, I mean, can we just talk about how many non-consensual kisses there were in the manga? Yeah. <laughs> it was just, I mean, from like, like, like the Black Moon arc with um, Prince Demand, and then Haruka, who's uh, Sailor Uranus, and then even like the Sailor Stars arc as well. I mean, she's mostly just like either caught off guard or she's just having some emotional breakdown then just randomly gets kissed yeah there's consent issues like from the jump yeah yeah and sailor moon like Mm -hmm. i uh. (laughs) yeah it's tough and as an adult interrogating that how much does that compromise the whole like kick-ass girl power like oh we're out here we are you know owning our power Okay, but at the same time, we've embedded all of these messages that are kind of concerning. Like they are not the things you would want to have like a young girl internalize like at all. I think we we talk about like how does something handle, uh, you know, difficult issues? And is it something that like over the course of time, would we still recommend it to somebody? And and this one, I feel like, yeah, I would still recommend it because I feel like there is something very like universally appealing two girls especially about Sailor Moon but I do feel like I would want to have a discussion about some of the <laughs> stuff that's in there that like I definitely did not have a discussion about when yeah. <laughs> when I was experiencing it but in some of it I just forgot about you yeah. know like it didn't even register to me as problematic when I was younger and now it's just okay wow that's not great yeah 
Yeah, that exists from her lens, too. Like, yeah. you wouldn't expect that, I guess, in the anime, but, like, it actually comes from her mangas as yeah. well. And I, I wonder how much of it is just, like, how she grew up in her experiences and, like, it's almost, like, wanted attention um, in at the time. I don't know. Like, it presents it in a way where it's almost, like, a positive. Like, people are just naturally drawn to her and, mm-hmm. like, her light and her... Um, mm-hmm. And just how loving she is. But, yeah, I don't think it ever... Well, and explores it's, anything it's there deeper. There was other characters too. Yeah. Like Maria is saying, like it's not like it's just limited to Sailor Moon either. Because like even from the very beginning in the manga, you know, Naru, the whole thing with yeah, oh, like that. <laughs> that to me was very because again, you're like, wait, they're in middle school. Like she's fourteen, and this is being presented as totally okay. Like the problem is like, well, he's a bad guy. It's not like he's really an adult he's old he's you know a predator it's just like well no he's evil but that seems completely disconnected and then his sort of like he has like a redemption arc basically like they give him a redemption arc so it's like presented as i don't know that was concerning to me because that's like there's nothing with naru at the beginning she's the normal person right she's the one that any of us could be Mm because she doesn't have any superpowers she's just she's just a neat girl, you know, and she's a good friend and she's there. It's a little concerning that like her love story, (laughs) it's just so fundamentally flawed. Like just the very basis of it is this 14 year old girl's purity and love redeemed this evil person to the point (laughs) that their love is beautiful. And it's like, no, it's not because he's he's old (laughs) and and also still like evil, but like, oh yeah. No, that one and the anime is like way, way bad on that one. Because like I had forgotten the part like where he gets like hit with the the thorns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she is like full on ripping her shirt (laughs) off to bandage him. And it's like, oh, no. Like (laughs) he just like veered into like another like genre of this is not appropriate. And yeah, it, it was wild. And there are issues here with consent yeah. from the beginning and I did I even went and looked up like age of consent in Japan because I'm thinking like maybe this is a cultural mm. thing where <laughs> the age of consent is 14 or something and that's just very different from here but it's not yeah I mean I think I'm gonna take it back a little bit but I think similar to what we discussed in the Felicity episode of American Girl I mean there's that whole like romanticizing a relationship with someone older than you and mm-hmm. I mean most many of I mean I I was about 13 I think when Sailor Stars came out and I was like watching it at five in the morning and it was just like I mean yeah it's the appeal is there but like now like reading it it's just like what is going on yes when you're a child when you're 12 or 13 you might be crushing on someone that is way out of age range for you, like in a boy band or, you know, an actor or something. Mm -hmm. And it would be completely illegal if it were to ever to happen. But is that because we've been damaged by media telling us like, (laughs) nah, this is cool. Like, this is fine. I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm sort of like torn between like how much of this stuff is like a natural impulse Mm -hmm. of a girl that age Versus how much of it is an impulse because we've had media sort of program us to think like that's what you should be wanting when you're that age, which is kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of that is also the fact that an 11 year old girl does not understand what a relationship with an adult Mm -hmm. man is actually going to entail. The fact that as a child, like we didn't see what was wrong with it because all we saw was, you know, oh, a hot character who was becoming good for her. And maybe they were going to hold hands and, oh, they might kiss. But I don't even think we fully processed that far. They couldn't go get their chocolate parfait. Yeah, yeah. they'll go on dates and he'll buy her presents and it'll be so sweet. But like there are aspects to a relationship that, you know, a child and an adult cannot have for legal reasons moral reasons just it's definitely the consent issues in sailor moon throughout and not even just with the female characters when you think about it Mm -hmm. mamoru gets like knocked out and then he has random evil women like kissing him his own daughter was one of them and it's kind of like that's actually really skeevy too Mm -hmm. because he's being kissed by all these people when he's unconscious but he clearly doesn't want it it was just 
non-consent all over the place. And that's definitely one of the more problematic things I think about Sailor Moon. Like even when Usagi stays over at Mamoru's apartment, like there's yeah. no one there. It's just them. Like what? So what's been happening to the parents now? It's yeah, it's all over the place. Well, I mean, that too, like. <laughs> the adults in Sailor Moon are just <laughs> they're either non-existent or they're just like the worst so I yeah. mean I don't know they're they're so checked out that yeah. it's like yeah there was a throwaway line in one where it's like oh I'll just tell my mom I'm sleeping over I'm like <laughs> what mom is gonna be okay with that and then they make a joke out of it where Mamoru is like it's like oh they'll lose their trust in me and I'm like, why haven't they lost it already? Know, right? <laughs> that was not the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. One of the girls just lives by herself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Lita, her parents died. Um, and it's like, what? <laughs> like, and that's a very common trope, too, in yeah. a lot of yeah. the manga. Mm-hmm. It's a, they're always by themselves. And it's just like, is this just more space for them to just... I don't know, get independent or just like grow. Yeah. Like the adults would just get in the way of yeah. development of the character or the plot. So they're just kind of conveniently <laughs> yeah. shunted off to the side. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about with uh, how it holds up is on the issue of body image. Mm. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, obviously in the anime, it's a lot more extreme than in the manga. Just everything. I mean, how how the transformations are depicted, how long they linger on the transformations, like just general male gaze issues and sort of the ideals that are sort of promoted. But one thing that I thought was really interesting is that Sailor Moon, at times, they do touch on some issues like that. Like they will be critical of that very issue, but then at the same time, it seems to be promoting the opposite thing. So like Usagi's diet comes up a mm-hmm. lot. Like yeah. they talk yeah. about like, oh no, Usagi, you're eating too much. Like you're going to get fat. Like don't do that. And then like everybody's obsessed with exercising and things like that. But they seem to be criticizing that everybody is doing that, like that they're concentrating too much on that. They're too like obsessed with the exercise and that left them open to be exploited by I don't know. It was Jadeite at that point or whoever, but like (laughs) one of the bad guys to like get their energy and stuff. But then, you know, the end of the episode is basically like, no, Usagi, you're eating too much again. So like it seems to like go back on like you think they're trying to make a point about this. Like, all right, they're they're being critical of this thing. This is what this story is meant to be. The take home is like, don't be so obsessed with your image. Don't be so obsessed with this. But then repeatedly they go back to like reinforcing this idea that like you need to be thin, you need to be curvy. So like all of the like costumes essentially that like Usagi will put herself into like, oh, in this situation, I need to look like the beautiful princess. I need to look like the flight attendant, like those types of things. The way that that's drawn is very sexualized. It is very like she's very curvy. She's very skinny. She's you know, a a very westernized uh, Mm -hmm. appearance of beauty. She has these huge eyes. She's blonde. Um, So I don't know. I wanted to bring up at least the body image issues because that is something that I don't, I don't feel like registered for me at all. Again, as a younger reader and watcher, but as an adult, they were jumping out at me a lot more. It's like, that's maybe not great. (laughs) You know, like I wonder... (laughs) wonder how, how you'd be experiencing this as a kid like yeah i feel like the contradictions in the anime could maybe be explained by just them wanting a very general audience and it's like this is the like this is what we should say because teen you know we want this to be like an educational show for like teen girls but then this is what we want to say because this show also should appeal to boys or ideally it should um, because we want as big of an audience as possible. So I don't know if that sometimes affects like what message they were That's trying to send. That's an interesting theory. Yeah. Like they're trying to be everything to everybody. Yeah, you know? because I feel like it wasn't just the body positivity one. It was also like there was definitely some on aging mm-hmm. and like it was almost like they wanted to say like, you know, you should age like naturally. But then they still like worry about it all the time. And then yeah. there are elements of the story that's like, well, they don't actually age. They like stop age or Usagi will stop aging at 22 and then she'll like live for that like hundreds to thousands of years and she'll still look the way that she does and so that's there are conflicting messages about yeah a lot of things actually yeah it's definitely and i mean you see this in society too like 
actresses and models are criticized for getting Botox, mm-hmm. for having surgery. Like, she's had two kids. What do you expect her, you know, breasts to look like after feeding two babies? Like, but then at the same time, if she said, like, who was it? I think it was Lucy Liu decided to use a surrogate when she wanted a child. And she was criticized for that. Mm-hmm. So, like, women are not supposed to do things to help themselves. They're supposed to age naturally. But if they don't age beautifully, then obviously they did something wrong. Like, why mm-hmm. didn't they do something to help themselves? Like, obvi- it's just it drives me crazy. Vilma and I were mentioning it earlier today that like colorism. I mean, mm-hmm. in oh, Japan, yeah. like the notion of beauty is typically light skinned or like, I mean, Usagi. She's the epitome of that beauty, that grace. She's the blonde. Like you said, Heather, big, beautiful round eyes. And like, and what we see is that we were, as we read, I mean, Pluto had actually darker toned skin in the manga. And in the 90s, revisiting the 90s anime has her that way. And I think it's Kunzite, one of the other um, Mm -hmm. villains also was uh, darker toned. But in Crystal, Pluto is light skinned. So we thought that was definitely like an interesting kind of change to it. I mean, yeah. In the nineties, was it more progressive versus now? Like in <laughs> yeah, the new yeah. One, I that's mean, strange that they would go backwards on yeah. that. Um, because you would think that whenever they re-release a show yeah. or they explore a show again, they they try actually very actively to be more progressive than its original. But in this case, that wasn't it. Yeah, that yeah. is interesting because they did make some changes, at least with the anime re-release. Yeah. To undo some of the like regressive censorship that mm-hmm. was done on the American version. So mm-hmm. like, especially like around LGBTQ issues, the version that was initially released in North America, like really drastically altered <laughs> a pretty core relationship <laughs> yeah. to make it more palatable, I guess, for Americans and Canadians. But then when they re-released Viz Media took that kind of stuff out. They added back scenes that had not been in the initial release here and and they made it track more closely with the storyline that it was meant to have. But that's very strange on the colorism issue that they would lighten characters in the most recent. Yeah. A few steps back, unfortunately. And I mean, thinking back to that, to the 90s anime and the uh, LGBTQ representation, it's actually funny because I I feel like as a kid, you picked up on it. Like you thought that was weird, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what grade I would have been in, maybe fourth. But even I was like, I feel like they're closer than cousins. But like, I don't know why I had that feeling at that time. But it's because, you know, visually they were written that way. And you could just tell that they just did a lot to try to change that dynamic. And it just didn't work. Yeah. I mean, the gazes they would give each other. Sorry to interrupt. But I mean, you could see it when they when (laughs) I I think the names they were given here in the States was Amara and Michelle. Mm -hmm. But they were like they would give each other these looks. And it's just like they don't look at each other like cousins. (laughs) (laughs) It, It was really weird the way that they tried to change it for like. U.S. media. And it was weird because it was already very educational to begin with, Mm -hmm. because like we said, they did try to be educational about certain topics and have certain messages. But then they felt like they needed to go further. And then they had that whole Sailor Moon says segment for a bit in the American release. But yeah, um, Sailor Moon has gone through a lot. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, we never even got to see Sailor Star's air because of it. I mean, we had gender bending scouts coming in from the different solar system and it's just like we never got to see that and it would have been such a great thing to show i mean even now hopefully it'll still come out but there's still no no news whether that's even going to happen also for the lgbtq plus representation there are questions about usagi sexuality so she and mamoru have the whole star-crossed lovers who have been in love for a thousand years and they'll be in love for two thousand more or whatever but there are hints that she's not necessarily straight like the first thing that hit me and it's probably because it was like the third chapter in the manga was that the first time she sees Ray, she gets like hard eyes and she's so awestruck by her that she like follows her off the bus, which by the way is really creepy. If a grown man <laughs> had done that to a teenage girl, we would not be like, oh, haha, ha, that's funny. No, we'd be like, <laughs> somebody call the police now. Maria was telling me about other things that she had caught. Like I did not catch the one with Jupiter, I think. See, I was going to yeah. ask, wasn't there something with Jupiter? But I remember thinking that there was 
There was a spark there too. Yeah. Not just that like, oh, <laughs> not just that. he loves to eat and Jupiter is a good cook. <laughs> like there was more to it than that. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Cause yeah, I think there's a little bit of like tension there as well. I was going to say, I wouldn't want to take away from that representation or that reading, but just add to that, that I feel like in a lot of Asian media and literature, I often see... Mm-hmm. I feel like I see it more like women admiring to the point of being like embarrassed or like nervous about another woman's beauty. Mm. Um, so I don't know if there's also just like a cultural element as well. But again, I would never take away from the reading that there's a fluidity there as well. I've definitely seen that. Yeah. And especially when the character that everybody's infatuated exhibits traditionally masculine Mm -hmm. characteristics usually it's a teenage girl they're usually in high school she's got a fan club like as like the popular prince character does and it's always like okay i mean a girl can be tall and like sports and this doesn't necessarily mean that you should immediately objectify her to be your prince i don't know anime is (laughs) weird there are certain things that you're just like (laughs) yeah they do that to haruka a lot yeah Mm -hmm. oh yeah a lot Mm -hmm. of them are like Mm -hmm. obsessed with haruka pretty quickly although i did with haruka It was always interesting because, I mean, you talked about the plot holes and the fact that she left a lot of things kind of open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. With Haruka, we never really got any real confirmation on anything. It was like when we were first introduced to Haruka, it was he pronouns, like a male, like we thought it was a male. And then we realized, no, they are, you know, female. They use she when they were wearing the scout uniform. And I think it was Neptune that kind of threw in, uh, they are neither female nor male. So that finally brought in, you know, non-binary, but it was never really fully addressed. And then it was just kind of like, we're going to move on now. Yeah. I mean, I think though, for the time that was still very open-minded and progressive. Like I, I feel like that was a pretty bold choice to make for the time. You know, now I guess it's kind of like, well, I wish you would have done more with that like that could have been interesting to explore that more it also could be that she didn't know like the language to kind of carry that further because i I feel (laughs) like people have asked her they're like okay well what is she and then she's like no well she's she's a woman because like sailor soldiers are only women women, or are only girls and so i think now she's kind of come more like hard on that issue where she's explicitly said that haruka is a girl but I feel like maybe she probably could have wanted to explore that, but maybe just didn't really have the language to do so. Yeah. And a big part of that, I think, is that the Japanese language doesn't really do gendered pronouns. Mm. So it's very easy to kind of not have to ascribe he and she, whereas, you know, English, everything has a feminine or a masculine tint to it. So I don't think that helped her in being able to translate it the way she would have wanted. So the Sailor Moon universe is just too big to hold in one episode, and we'll be returning to this conversation in part two. In the meantime, please check out our blog linked in the episode notes. As always, feel free to drop us a tweet. We're at PGCMLS on Twitter, and hashtag ThesebooksMadeMe with suggestions for books and manga you'd like to see us cover in the future.